Evolution and Creation, Rick Roberts. Good evening. Where did we come from? Did all living things evolve gradually from a common ancestor, or are we the product of a creator? Evolution versus creation, an old argument that made its way back in the, into the news last week when a court hearing was held in California. Kelly Seagraves, the director of the Creation Science Research Center in San Diego, brought the suit against the state of California over the teaching of evolution. Seagraves walked into a Sacramento courtroom last week to challenge California's right to teach evolution as the only valid scientific theory of the origin of man. It's a trial many called Scopes in Reverse, referring to the famous Scopes monkey trial 55 years ago, when biology teacher John Scopes was found guilty of teaching evolution, which was illegal under Tennessee law. Today in science classes throughout the country, evolution is the theory that man and other living things evolved gradually from a common ancestor is the accepted scientific explanation. We feel that's a violation of the religious rights of my children. After all, they do believe in God and they believe that God created all things. And so they learn one thing on Sunday in Sunday school and one thing in the home. And now the school is telling them something else. And they're telling them as if this is fact and they must believe that. During the first day in court, Seagrave's attorney attempted to reduce the legal argument to a simple question. Are his client's religious beliefs being violated? He's got an absolute right to those beliefs, and he's got an absolute right that this government protect those beliefs so long as they're sincerely held. The attorney for California schools was going to broaden the trial and argue that evolution is based on scientific evidence and creation is not. These people are going to have to show that they are a scientific theory. He did not aver that they are a scientific theory or an alter alternative scientific theory. And without such an averment and without proof to that fact, their complaint must fall. The judge, however, did not let either side introduce testimony regarding the merits of evolution and creation. At last Friday, the judge ruled that the teaching of evolution does not violate the rights of those who believe in creation. But the judge ordered the California school district to remind all of its schools of the official policy that evolution is taught as theory, not dogma. But the issue may not die in California. Fundamentalist Christian groups say the trial was only the beginning of a nationwide crusade against teaching evolution in schools without giving equal time to creation. Last year, the Iowa Senate defeated a bill that would have required a balanced treatment of evolution and creation in public schools. A similar bill has been introduced in the Senate this year, and 5TV's Rob Downey talked with the bill's sponsor. Well, the reason we need the bill is because many in the educational field and in the science, uh, science field are so biased that they don't want the other side to be also evaluated and made evident to the teachers in the state that they can teach it. Many of them think that they cannot. Have educators come to you asking for a bill such as this? Some have, yes. Where is most of your uh, demand for this bill coming from? Well, it's not from a particular pocket, but it's from individuals uh, from various areas. And what do you think would be the, the, the main benefit? Do you think uh, students right now aren't getting a, a well-rounded education, so to speak? Some are and some aren't. For instance, in Cedar Falls, there is uh, a program put in place where they do use both models but in many places they do not and some think they can't some don't because they don't want to because of their bias and so you have this whole mix the issue of whether or not students should be taught creationism alongside evolution centers around one key question is it a scientific theory or just a religious conviction evolutionists call their view of man's beginning scientific because it was reached through experimentation and observation but creationists argue that while their view was not reached in the same way, it is still a scientific theory and should be taught as such. Evolutionists counter this position with the charge that to label as scientific a theory which is based on supernatural elements is ludicrous. The very idea of including supernatural intervention is foreign to science. And uh, this is the essence, this is the very essence of creationism. We're talking here about miraculous events that are being used to 
explain, if you will, a, uh, the spectrum of life as we now see it on the, on the face of the earth. Science makes the effort to entertain seriously those proposals that are brought before it, and it does so, and then whatever proposals are brought before it have a very good chance of failing. And when they fail, scientists will throw them out. They don't entertain things in the sense that this concept must survive uh, at all cost. This is the way the creationists, however, entertain their principles. And uh, so, in, in essence, they are, dealing, they are dealing with an ideology based on faith, which, which uh, in their mind cannot fail. There's no evidence that you could use to convince a creationist that there wasn't a creation that took place or that there was no creator. But instead of denying the charge that their theory is unscientific, many creationists argue that it is no less provable than evolution. Evolutionists point out principles of genetic similarities and natural selection as proof of their theory. Creationists, on the other hand, cite examples of present-day conditions which could have resulted from biblical events. Probably the most popular is what they perceive as geological evidence of the 40-day flood. While evolutionists say that fossils are the result of an evolutionary process, creationists claim that they also could have resulted from Noah's flood. In his book, Scientific Creationism, Dr. Henry Morris claims that research has shown today's geological conditions to be the same as those which would have resulted from such a flood. But creationists stress that they are not necessarily touting their theory to be right and the evolutionists to be wrong. They just maintain that they're both worthy of instruction. Morris probably put it best when he said creation is just as much a science as is evolution, and evolution is just as much a religion as is creation. Another popular criticism of evolution relates to the theory's basic tenet of complex organisms developing from simpler ones. They claim that no system will grow more complex without the direction of a guiding hand, or possibly a creator. In this way, they dispute the evolutionist belief that life just randomly continued to develop into more and more complex forms. They say that without any deliberate direction, life would regress, not move forward. But Patterson flatly denies this view. He says the laws of thermodynamics prove that elements do become more complex on their own. But some creationists like microbiologist Lloyd Quinn go beyond theological criticism and attack the very beginning of evolution. Quinn claims that the evolutionary idea of the sudden appearance of life on Earth known as spontaneous generation is physically impossible. I don't think any biologists believe in spontaneous generation. Meaning? A life from non-life that no matter how complicated or complex the mixture of chemicals may be that you stir up together, it's, um, unless it's already living, it's not going to uh, generate life. As a microbiologist, neither I nor any of my colleagues ever see spontaneous generations of even the simplest form of life in the test tube. It, um, as far as we're concerned, it's impossible now but we asked Quinn how he explained experiments which have allegedly duplicated the conditions of ancient Earth and yielded life. This is an unscientific area. No one has any way of knowing what the composition of the Earth's atmosphere was back at the time that these people feel life originated. Um, you have to make some off the top of your head guesses, and you can find people who uh, supposedly are expert in this area who will say that it was uh, rich in oxygen. Others will say, no, it was not. There was no oxygen there at all. The creationist model presented in the Bible and the evolutionary model that has come from the humanists, um, both are models, and I think they should be mentioned as, as such. Um, the religious education uh, belongs in the churches, but there isn't enough support for the evolutionary model uh, for it to be exclusively the only thing that students uh, ever hear about. Evolutionists like Patterson say, however, that there is more scientific support for evolution than there is for creationism. The majority of the country's scientists seem to accept at least the basis of evolution. In fact, the Iowa Academy of Sciences officially announced their opposition to teaching creationism in the classroom. But one intriguing question which arises here is how science teachers who believe in God and the Bible can teach evolution in good conscience. The answer lies in a unique reconciliation of evolutionary theory with religious belief.
This requires the individual to interpret biblical events to be religious descriptions of the events in the evolutionary process. For example, the idea has been presented that each of the six days which the Bible says it took God to create the earth could have lasted a billion years apiece. Supporters of this idea say this would satisfy the evolutionist estimation of the Earth's age and the creationist concept of a creator. Ames High School science teacher Gerald Dunn subscribes to this theory and doesn't think a minimal instruction in creation is harmful. I just believe that uh, there are a set of rules out there and uh, God laid those rules out. And uh, those rules, in, in my uh, estimation, took a long period of time to go through, you see. And uh, when it came time for Adam to be there and to making him man, or for example, having a soul, that could be done instantly, you see. Even though the body took long periods of time to evolve, you see, I think that soul part could have been given in a moment or whatever it is. Do you think creationism should be taught in the classroom? Well, um, let, let me put it in a, a frame of perhaps one hour time. Um, I would say I probably spend about uh, roughly 15 minutes talking about uh, the scientific creationist point of view concerning evolution and uh, perhaps uh, maybe 45 minutes then talking about the scientific uh, point of view regarding the theory of, of evolution. How do you view both sides? Well, being a scientist, of course, I, I tend to believe in cause and effect. And um, I guess you would say I am personally uh, believe in evolution. Um, however, I do feel that there is the other side. Evolution is still a theory. And um, I think we need to talk about it as a theory. It's not fact. And so we do tend to present both sides. But I, I admit I don't spend as much time with the scientific creation <coughs> part of it as I do the, uh, the other part. Why not? I feel more comfortable with the scientific part of it. See, my background happens to be science, and uh, I'm much more comfortable with that. And I, I'm less comfortable with the, um, the readings of the Bible, even though I have read them. Um, they're open to interpretation and so forth, and I'm just not comfortable with that part of it. So there are evolutionists who claim that creationism is not scientific enough to be seriously considered. There are creationists who dispute the very core of evolution. And then there are men like Gerald Dunn who are able to accept both theories. Sound confusing? It is, but if we find it perplexing, what about those students who are directly affected by two very divergent theories? Does it confuse them? Well, it doesn't really confuse me because I, I won't let it, because I'll believe in, in the Bible and I just, I, don't, I won't pay attention to what it says in the books. You know, I'm not that religious, but you know, what they say in the Bible, I think is pretty true, but he teaches us about how people came from fish and I just don't know how they can have a man coming from a fish. No. Uh, if you sit down and you think about it for a couple of minutes, no, it doesn't have you confused. What do you believe? I believe in uh, the combination of the both. Yeah, it does, because they tell you in the Bible that God created everything, and then you come to school and they tell you that you evolved from the apes or something, and it's hard to understand. You don't know what to believe. What conclusions have you reached uh, from studying both ideas? I still don't know. There's, they are not sure about. I mean, if you believe in the Bible, then you believe in that one. And when you come here, there's still a lot of doubts about it, and they don't know for sure. So, I still don't know which one because it's, you know, they contradict each other so much. In a moment, we'll continue our discussion of evolution and creation with two in-studio guests.
Joining us now are Warren Dolphin, a biology professor at Iowa State University, and Bert Wagner, who has taught creation, uh, creationism to various classes in, in mm -hmm. Iowa. Warren, I'd like to start with you. Could you just kind of refresh our memory now as to what are we talking about evolution and the scientific case for evolution? Well, the term evolution uh, really has two meanings, one to the physical scientist and one to the biological scientist. The physical scientists will talk about how the universe has changed over time from the origin event if, uh, and the origin event as physical science has shown it to us is really uh, the Big Bang occurring about 20 million years ago, or 20 billion, excuse me, and then uh, coming forward to the present time. Now we have this particular planet in the universe, Earth, and about four and a half billion years ago, the conditions on the surface of the Earth became such that living forms could appear. That is, there was a cool down in temperature. And uh, at that time, there was a mixture of inorganic gases and uh, elements uh, on the Earth's surface. And there have been some interesting experiments done by uh, Sidney Fox, who was a biochemist. He used to be here at Iowa State in the biochemistry department. And uh, Fox and other associates have shown that simple gases can combine to form uh, organic kinds of molecules, which in turn can form primitive cell-like structures. No one has created life out of this, but we have some interesting hypotheses. This might have been the way it occurred. For the next four and a half billion years, we don't really know other than what we can look back at. And what we can look back at are the fossils. And what we see in the fossils are that simpler forms tend to be in the lower sedimentary layers and more complex ones in the upper layers. And in the 1940s and 1950s, radiochemical dating techniques showed that those layers, in fact, represent a chronology using such things as potassium argon dating, uh, lead and uranium dating, uh, that it has been possible to show that the lower layers were laid down billions of years ago and that the upper layers have been laid down more recently. So we speak of a fossil record, a chronology. Uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, we've had tremendous developments in the field of genetics. And what we have seen from the field of genetics is that there can be variation in populations. Natural selection can act on that variation, leading to adaptation. The biologist then studying these things in the current world then projects backward in time and says that these things would have applied and could be the means whereby the different forms developed in the fossil record, the tremendous diversity that we see there. So the scientist is taking data, observations from many different fields, putting them together into an overall theory and trying to make his explanations that way. We call it the theory of evolution. Mm -hmm. it, 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 what does that word theory uh, mean well, to the, a scientist? The, the theory to a scientist is different than, say, the theory to people around the coffee urn and coffee break. Uh, there, I think it means it's just the best guess. Whereas in science, we speak about gravitational theory, atomic theory. And no one doubts that gravity exists. No one doubts that uh, atoms exist. No one has observed atoms. No one has gone in and seen protons and neutrons and electrons. Yet, there are certain predictions you can make with that theory, and uh, in making those predictions, you find that there are certain consequences. Likewise, in th uh, with the theory of evolution, <clears throat> the facts in the case are that we can uh, uh, see the genetic mechanisms today. We can see the fossil record. The theory projects back <clears throat> and tries to unite these observations along with observations from the physical sciences. Uh, <clears throat> it's a theory that can be tested, uh, in fact, as a scientist, I think there is an experiment that can be done that would actually falsify evolution. It would do a lot to change my mind. And that is that if you could prove that all of the organisms that are in the fossil record, plus all of the organisms that are present today, if they had coexisted at some time in the past, they were all lived at the same time, then, in fact, the theory of evolution has problems. Uh, however, uh, that... Uh, Observation has been, uh, observations have been carried out the, uh, along this line, and uh, the evidence that comes from that shows that, in fact, we do have a sequence of organisms represented in the fossil record, that we do not have the coexistence. And uh, so uh, 
the whole heart of science is one of trying to put forward a theory, <coughs> trying to falsify that theory. The theory becomes more and more probable as it resists test of falsification. So <coughs> I, does that answer your question yes, it on does. what the theory is? Mr. Wagner, what about a scientific case for creation? Well, I've done a lot to promote this uh, throughout the state. I made presentations to uh, in-service training teachers at the Mass, uh, made it, uh, Mason City uh, area. To what are you telling these people about what the scientific? What I tell them, uh, I'd like to quote from the bill that's in the Senate, and this will give you some idea of what we're actually talking about. A sudden creation of the universe, energy and life from nothing. The inefficiency of mutation and natural selection in bringing about development of all kinds from a single source, organism. Changes only within fixed limits of originally created kinds of plants and animals separate ancestry for man and apes, explanation of Earth's uh, geology by catastrophism, including the occurrence of a worldwide flood. We disagree with his explanation that these things were laid down over millions of years. Uh, relative recent inception of Earth and living kinds. Uh, we're interested in looking at the scientific concepts, but to say that the evolutionary viewpoint is the only concept that can be presented in the class, is discriminatory against a great number of scientists today that say they find a great deal of scientific concepts that support a creation model. And you just heard the definitions that I spelled out that uh, would outline the model. I've brought a great deal of resource material that teachers can use in this area so that the science teachers he walks into the class can give the student a scientific theory that is in competition with what the evolutionists are telling us today. And uh, it was mentioned that science has looked at this and found it in the test tube, and the geologic records support this. But in a uh, national magazine in November, it is now being brought out by the scientific community. And this is a November 3rd of Newsweek. It says, evidence from fossils now points overwhelmingly away from classical Darwinism, which most Americans learned in high school. This is what we're concerned about. Let's look at all the scientific concepts, but let's share with the students all that science knows and not just an evolutionary interpretation. Do you have any hard scientific proof to well, support your side? Uh, I would say probably the fossil record is the hardest. That's what uh, most everybody looks at as being the real classical evidence. And I've got a letter here from a uh, paleontologist with the British Museum of Natural History. He wrote a book on evolution. So he classes himself as an expert. But in this uh, letter to a creationist on the East Coast, he says, if I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. What this man asked for is give us an illustration of the transitional forms. This man says there are no transitional forms in the fossil record. And when you look at the fossil record, what you see are the various types of uh, organisms, many of them we see today. Where are all these transitional forms as we look in our world today? Why aren't many of them living if we have seen this transition take place? Well, Mr. Dolphin, what happens when a scientist tries to take this belief in creation and give it some scientific merit? Well, I think we have to examine uh, what is science, all right, if we're going to include uh, something like this in it. And science is a way of um, finding out knowledge, finding out relationships. And it is predicated on the fact that there is order in the universe and that that order can be explained through the operation of natural law. It does not include an appeal to the supernatural. Uh, that if the supernatural were brought in, and in fact, in the, uh, the creation model, if you read the various groups that put forward the creation model, I see that, uh, if I can borrow this, uh, Bert, the scientific case for creation, as well as in the other writings of the author, who is the uh, head of the Institute for the Creation uh, Research, that they must refer to the Bible. Henry Morris has said that if we are going to understand creation, uh, then, and we are going to understand the duration and the methods of creation, then the answers must be sought in the Bible. Uh, the creationism movement is an attempt to bring in God as defined in the Christian religion. It is attempt, an attempt to bring in uh, creation as defined in the Bible, uh, which is the mainstay of uh, the, crea uh, the main book, reference book of the creation of, uh, of uh, Christianity. Now, 
science will not appeal to the supernatural in its explanations because science operates by seeking to falsify theories that are put out. We call them hypotheses. And if you're studying a situation, you put out several hypotheses, and now you go and you conduct experiments. Why are those experiments conducted? In order to limit the hypotheses. You rule certain ones out. You falsify them. And then you're left by default with a predominating hypothesis, a ruling hypothesis. And if that stands the test of time, it develops to the stage of a theory. If we were to bring in a supernatural, it would be beyond, by definition, beyond the laws of natural science and uh, would not be subject to this falsifying test. It would be a dead end in science. And that was what Dr. Patterson was referring to earlier in the show. Well, Mr. Wagner, what about the teaching of creation in schools? Can it be done without reference to the Bible, keeping in mind now separation of church and state? I'm talking public schools. Yeah, yes, in fact, I know of several teachers in the state of Iowa that are now teaching a two-model program in a science class. One of these recently presented his presentation to the House and Senate Education Committee members, and every one of them that saw this said they condone and support that type of program being taught in our public schools. This is why we have the bill before our legislative session. Let me refer to a few. I've done some writing in this area. The state superintendent wrote me March 9, 1978. The paper titled Creation, Evolution, and Public Education places no restriction on the Urbandale Board of Directors or any other public or private school in this state. The determination of the place for the evolution and creation models in the science curriculum is one of local determination. I've also written to the National Science Foundation. I asked them when they condone the censorship of the scientific concepts of a creation model from our teachers and students. They wrote back November 18, 1980, the history of science demonstrates only too clearly what happens when countries or institutions attempt to dictate or censor scientific theories. You can be sure the National Science Foundation for the good of the science and the good of this nation has not and will not dictate or censor scientific theories. Mainly the opposition is coming from the evolutionary community. It's not coming from the community in general. We have one minute left. Mr. Dolphin, uh, your views on the teaching of creation in public schools or universities? Uh... I think that it's not science mm. and mm. that I think they have had a fair hearing uh, that if we look at what has happened at most local school boards, if we look at what has happened in the Department of Public Instruction, in the state legislatures, in the Iowa Academy of Science, in the American Adva Association for the Advancement of Science, the National Academy of Science, the courts, <clears throat> in each case they have been ruled against. And <clears throat> what has the ruling been? It's religion. It's not science. Now I defend <clears throat> Bert's right to teach that <clears throat> in church-related schools, but not to teach it in the classroom. And I think I'm with the majority, not only of scientists, but clergy and the public in that position. Okay, thank you. That is uh, all the time we have, unfortunately. We thank you for joining us tonight.